Welcome to uh, phdchannel.com. I'm Rene Molina, your host. Tonight, we have a special guest and our special guest is, uh, I consider him as an honorary Filipino. Not only honorary, yeah, he is really a Filipino, but he is a Kiwi. I'd like to welcome Dr. Uh, Murray His Hisley. Doc, and I always call him Doc. Doc, how are you, Doc? Rene, I'm very well, thank you. Yeah, Doc's easier. Um, easier. <laughs> yeah, one of the reasons that I, um, my first name is Murray, but when Filipinos see the name Murray, it looks like Morai, if they're thinking in Tagalog. Ah, yes. So, so right. most people know me as Doc or Peter, mm -hmm. most, my, my yes. middle name. Yeah. Your middle name. Uh, and uh, Doc used to be a professor at the University of the Philippines, uh, the English department. Can, can you tell me a little bit about uh, that journey when you were in the Philippines, uh, Doc? Yeah, happily. So uh, uh, it's interesting. I arrived um, on December the 30th, which was the same day as the LRT bombing. Um, oh. And um, uh, didn't really know anybody in the Philippines. That, um, uh, I'm, I'm an adventurer and uh, I uh, approached a, a number of different departments. I'd read about the University of the Philippines and uh, I wanted to uh, have a look at it. You know, it's a famous university and uh, so I, I took a, a, a trip up there and uh, I, I'm, an, I'm an historian and I was hoping to get work as an historian, but no, that didn't happen. I ended up being picked up by the English department um, mm. and, and teaching Shakespeare and uh, English 1, English 10, which used to be uh, different names of different programs there and taught at UP. UP is wonderful because, uh, you know, I'm a bit of a rebel and I can dress as, as I please, <laughs> and uh, they had uh, uh, classes of 25, uh, you know, very different from other universities. Mm -hmm. And um, um, so I was allowed to express myself as I wished. And um, so I taught in the University of the Philippines English department, big department, Rene, you know, yes, 90 right. there, it's almost bigger than most colleges. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, in faculty center, which of course has burnt down. I, I arrived on the day it burnt down actually. I didn't, oh, of course, <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I I loved my time there. It was uh, four years teaching at the University did, of the English Department. Did, did you live in the campus, Doc, or uh, were no, you I in... wish, I wish No, I wish I could. It's very difficult to get living on the campus. Yeah. I mm -hmm. lived off the mm -hmm. campus. I lived in uh, um, different places, um, Teacher's Village. I lived in uh, uh, Matahimek, uh, which is the, no the, yeah, the noisiest street, although it's called Matahimek, <laughs> it's the noisiest street. In, uh, in Anonas, uh, different places, um, and uh, yeah, four or five different locations, and and many of my close friends are, are, are my colleagues there, uh, mm -hmm. still to this day, and students that I taught. Did, did yeah. you take the public transportation in going from your home to the campus, or uh... well, I, well, since since I lived close to the to the campus, I generally walked, but uh, oh, otherwise. Wow. Yeah, otherwise Toki or Ikot. I mean, I was close enough to, <laughs> to the campus to be able to take uh, jeepneys. And, uh, but generally, I'm a great walker, Rene. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. uh, I walked. Um, so, yeah, public transport, of course. And uh, you, you, you didn't get any chance to go to the history department? You already you, you got immersed in yeah. your the department? Yeah, so uh, really the English, uh, the history department, see my background, my PhD, my doctorate uh, is in um, uh, Pacific uh, uh, history. Uh, my expertise mm -hmm. is Fijian and Tongan. I speak Fijian and Tongan. I went abroad when I was 19 and learned those languages. So uh, the first, the second language in my life was Fijian. And many of my closest friends are Fijians. I married a Tongan in my first marriage, so Tongan. Um, and... Um, and then I did a PhD in pre-Christian Fiji, looking at what Fiji mm -hmm. was like before there was any Christianity um, in the politics. It was more an anthropological, historical kind of approach, really. Um, so, and then I taught different places uh, using in, in that background uh, in Pacific. So that didn't really fit into UP's history department. They didn't have papers on oh, yes. that. So. Yeah. Um, I ended up teaching in the English department and a uh, mm -hmm. bit of luck actually because I think they had somebody lined up who decided they wanted to get better pay and taught it oh, okay. because you know, <laughs> the pay at UP in 2001 
you know, um, uh, in, in New Zealand dollars is about $150. Uh, in, what's That's that correct. Uh, yeah. You know, it, it's, it's, it's uh, slave wages. So you, you would teach at UP. I, I taught at UP for the love. Mm -hmm. um, and for the money side of it, I did IELTS. So, oh, yes. Yes. Yeah, IELTS uh, for the money and uh, UP for the love. So the IELTS, uh, you were doing it uh, simultaneous with uh, your uh, teaching at the university. So IELTS was still done by the British Council then, or was it already in a private? Uh, no, no, private there were two, two organizations that offered it. British Council, which is the English uh, side of it, and IDP, which is the Australian uh, organization uh -huh. that offered it. So I originally was teaching with British Council, and then I ended up teaching I mean, uh, doing IELTS mainly through IDP, and and through that I got to travel from, well, probably more than most Filipinos from to mm -hmm. from Tuggerau to General Santos City. Uh, you name the place wow. I went. So they would send me to places that people often were a bit worried about going to Iligan, um, oh, oh, oh. General Santos in, City. In yeah, 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 uh, and I loved <laughs> it. I used to dress uh, like a thug, you know. Uh, uh, and uh, people used to think uh, uh, the military thought that I was a uh, American military, so they'd salute me. Uh -huh. What's up? I, I, I'm an American, so it was funny for me because I'm a left wing. I don't, I don't like American presence anyway. So, but it treated me very well because I look like a military, you know, like uh, like mm -hmm. a like a murderer basically, um, and uh, nobody saw me as a Shakespeare teacher. <laughs> or an IELTS as a motorbike, you know, I ride, I ride yeah. motorbikes for me. Yeah. yeah, about the motorbike, were you drive, uh, riding the motorbike in, in the Philippines? In, oh, in yes. Oh, well, yes, yes. Oh. I, I used to get around in uh, B, uh, BMW, like the 19, like like the uh, fairing mm -hmm. 87 police bikes, a very big bike, yeah. mm -hmm. so 1100 cc. Um, and then I got a Honda Magna. I had a lot of accidents on, on the motorcycles. Oh. I, oh, I had wow. a... a uh, my my left arm uh, on Etsa once I, I fell over on on Etsa. Someone had poured oh, oil. Oh. I ended up with a with my bone through my chest, um, and that got fixed. And then later I had a, I broke seven ribs going up to Tarlac. My wife was on the bike. She's Filipino, oh. Uh, oh. and she, she wasn't hurt. So a lot of accidents, but lots of fun because you know sometimes mm. in the Philippines, Renee, the concrete road turns to mud. No warning. So, oh, yes, yeah. yes, mm -hmm. that's what happened to me, yeah. And uh, 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 uh around that time in, in UP, also, there was another professor who was also fond of motorbikes, uh, Randy David, uh, of Professor course. David Randy, yep. Uh, yep. He, but he was with sociology, I think, with the sociology department, yes. Yeah, so, I didn't actually, meet Randy and he's, he's a, a um, a Philippine Daily Inquirer columnist, yes, yes, and, uh, a columnist, and has, been for, has been for many years. Um, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, UP is marvelous, wonderful. It's a uh, it's a world unto itself. Mm -hmm. And my favorite part was a uh, film center where you could see films for you know twenty pesos. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> yes. and, and around that time that you were teaching, uh, Doc, I was uh, taking my uh, masters, my my second win because I started my masters in eighty six. And it lapsed in 1990, so I did that. I was doing the the writing, so I came back in 2000 to uh, and I finished it in 2004. So around that time, I was also I was also in in the same campus, but we were in a different uh, college. We're in the College of Mass Communication. It's the other and side. Of, the, yeah, of course, yeah, of course, because at one stage I was going to do a. Uh, an interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary study into waste management, and you know, oh. in uh, um, in the uh, 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 main building there, the alumni building down below, there's an interdisciplinary department. So I had uh, friends in MassCom all over: sociology, anthropology, philosophy, economics. Um, so, and and some of my best classes were the summer electives, where students from these different departments would come and do my oh, yes my Shakespeare mm -hmm. class, and they often mm -hmm. were the best English speakers, oddly. They didn't always follow that the English department had the best English speakers. Sometimes they were from economics, they were from mass comm, of course, philosophy. It's a wonderful campus. Mm -hmm. it, it would be good if we can uh, turn back the time and uh, 
I will draw you to, I, I was teaching at Miriam College uh, across uh, yeah, Uni, across yeah. Ateneo, and yeah, we yeah. were very much immersed into the and uh, echo way, solid ways. I would have drawn you into that group of- That uh, would have been wonderful. I have a very good friend, Papa Taxil, who was also teaching at Miriam for some time. And uh, yes, yes, yes. You may know him. He's a Palanca Prize winner. Yes, um, yes. Yeah, yeah, very, very bright guy. Yeah. Because mo most of the, uh, we were also getting part-time teachers, uh, professors from uh, UP mm -hmm. to teach in uh, in Miriam. But there yeah. came a time when UP said, oh, you're getting all of our good professors. <laughs> so they stopped that, that, that arrangement, you know. But, well, but, yeah. but teaching really, uh, Doc, is, uh, I think it's, You've been, you know, uh, it is it's a passion on your part uh, on teaching. You took your PhD from the University of Otago. Uh, am I, I am did. I correct? Uh, I did. Um, so that was a, a what it is still a wonderful university, and uh, they had a joint chair. They had a guy called uh, Hugh McLeod, who was the world authority on Sikhism, and he taught me uh, how sense uh, um, uh, Hindi, how to speak Hindi and read Hindi, um, and uh, John O. McCooper, who was the other chairperson, was the world authority on Shaka and Zulu. Uh, and he was a massive supporter of, uh, of Nelson Mandela many years before uh, it was, you know, safe to be so. So it was yeah. like a Camelot, a Camelot in, uh, uh, um, um, history department, just fantastic. And in um, and, and my own uh, supervisor, uh, Gordon Parsonson, who turned 100 two years ago, still alive. Oh. Uh, he was, he, he's a world authority on Pacific history. So I was taught by very, very wonderful men who had no, who were very humble. They had no ears about themselves. They believed on passing, passing on and, and encouraging others. And when I came to the University of the Philippines, my pedagogy, if you like, my, my way of teaching was very different from many others in that I encouraged students to, to be creatively critical thinkers by themselves rather than mm -hmm. impose a world view on them and um mm -hmm. so uh, i think that my classes were very very popular because they, they were different and um and, and i wanted to make a point about a phd renee if mm -hmm. i may mm -hmm. so here's a little bit of w worldly advice from a guy with a phd i got mine in 83 long before before many of your viewers would have been born i'm 70 now mm -hmm. and um um so if you ever run across a person from any country who has a PhD, who mm -hmm. thinks that they're cleverer than you or superior to you in any way, or have uh, arrogance about them, uh, clearly they have something wrong with their brains. Because oh. what, you should, what you should learn from a PhD is how little you know about anything. A PhD is someone who learns, and I'm not denigrating a PhD, Anyone that can have the time to do it, please do it because it, it can um, develop uh, the ability to focus, to research, to be critical in your thinking. That's the ideal. So the end result should be uh, with a PhD is you realize you learn more and more about less and less until you become an expert, a world authority you should be, in a very tiny field of knowledge. And when mm -hmm. you finish the PhD, it's a little bit like, uh, it's the Pacific Ocean and you have just taken one drop of that ocean and once it hits that ocean, it dissipates. So you learn more and more about less and less. So what you should come away from, Renee, in my view, is a deep mm -hmm. humility about how little you know, but a willingness to engage. I, I call this um, uh, ignorance theory. The, not, the, the, the understanding, the, 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 the uh, sense that... Um, there's so much to learn, but don't be frightened by the fact that you know next to nothing because you have a life to 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 uh, to keep exploring the, the mystery mm -hmm. of the universe. So mm -hmm. that's a wonderful thing. So if you strike somebody who is who is arrogant, that's got a PhD, they've learned absolutely nothing. Nothing, yeah. That, no, that, because that, you know you should learn humility from it. And so I'm a great believer in interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary studies. The ability to learn from from other people um, and the willingness to share uh, that that that's my uh, uh, take on on a doctorate that you uh, yeah, yes yes you know it's wonderful to to earn to learn a skill 
but you should come away from the school um, uh, being more humble about about what you know, what you don't know. So uh, don't ever be intimidated intimidated by somebody with a doctorate. If you meet somebody with a doctorate that understands what it's be all about, they should be engaging people that you can uh, relate to, you know, mm -hmm. and people willing to share whatever they know. That, that sh that's that's my uh, that's my belief oh. about a doctorate. Thank you for that uh, inspiring uh, and uplifting uh, message, uh, uh, Doctor uh, Hisley. Because we, yeah, uh, I, I have encountered uh, <laughs> heaps of uh, these people. You know, they're, they're like up there in in their ivory tower, and and, and I subscribe to idea to the idea that it's an, an ongoing process. Once you have your PhD, you you enrich it with research, right? Like oh, absolutely, you know, uh, yeah. It's a never ending. This, Renee, it's 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 a willingness to accept your ignorance. Ignorance theory is very liberating because you accept that you are an idiot savant would be a term, another term that you could use. Oh. And you're, you're a savant in a tiny area, but you're an idiot in most areas. So, um, uh, but but that's a source of joy because mm -hmm. you, you you realize that in this brief life, you know what have we got? Seven decades. I've reached my uh, three score and ten already. So and, and I've just recovered from liver cancer. So um, oh. I'm, very, I'm very aware of um, uh, uh, the teachers that you meet, and your viewers will understand this. There's certain people you meet, primary school, grade school, high school that you remember with great affection, yes. and those yes. people are the people that encouraged you. The the, the teachers that you that you uh, that leave you cold are those that made you feel small. For no reason other than their own insecurities yes. so if somebody is to put you down if somebody is to to undermine you in some way that's not on you that's on them they have some oh. issue you know uh some issue in their own lives and therefore they take pleasure from belittling other people that these are kinds of these are these are pygmies mentally pygmies and mm -hmm. uh, and you shouldn't let them dissuade you or turn you away from your passion uh I think everyone has different kinds of intelligence and mm -hmm. and so when i was teaching at up i, I sought tried to seek out um the, the what was in the intelligence of each person and recognize it because up has you know wonderful students it's just a, a, a absolute pleasure to, yes. to be at that place and, and, they, uh, and, and they come from all all sectors of society all strata from from the province from the most uh you know uh deprived uh, but brilliant minds and uh, willing to step up and uh, you know uh, do something with their lives. While you, you were, while, while you were mentioning that, uh, Doc, I am reminded of that movie. Uh, yeah, Goodbye. Was that good? It's a uh, Peter O'Toole. Goodbye, Mr. Chips. It's about this 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 teacher. He was teaching the. I think they were high school. In, in England, and they're at the brink of war and something like that, you know. And uh, oh, I wish I was uh, sitting in your class and uh, listening to to your words of wisdom, Doc Hisley. Are you are you are you still doing? Uh, because right now you you are you are an IELTS. Uh, you see, uh, you you prepare students for the IELTS, right? So that's part of like what you're doing as like a, you're not formally lecturing, but you you're still practicing your. Uh, your profession yeah. doctor yeah if people come to me and want to be helped with ielts uh, i'll do it if they want to be like a client and they want deeper uh, uh teaching i have my own method for doing that i don't do much mm -hmm. soliciting anymore renee um mm -hmm. if, if people uh, i think i'm very good at it i i was a ielts examiner for uh, 12 years so i've done twenty four thousand interviews and marked twenty four thousand papers and um it's it's a it's it's a it's a horrible exam because it's unfair. It's culturally inappropriate. I don't think mm. that Filipinos see in in my in my experience. Um, certainly, if people from the upper echelon universities, you name them, UP, mm. Ateneo, or, and 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 even another universities, uh, La Salle, um, uh, Lyceum, lots of them. I, I don't want to actually specify them, but students that have been to those or even good high schools. Um, English is not really a second language. Uh, it's 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 often, in my view, uh, a contemporaneous first language. It's a language that you use in school and professional situations. Whereas, uh, um, 
the social language, a cultural language, is Tagalog or Bisaya or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so I find it um, um, uh, an imposition of colonial racist uh, uh, thinking to make Filipinos do an exam and treat them as if they are using a second language. They're not. The, the, the best uh, for, uh, English speakers I've ever met are my colleagues at, at UP. They're better than, than native speaking New Zealand uh, uh, English speakers. So um, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I've been leading a campaign to try and kill that exam. Um, to, mm. to, because what you'll find is that, you know, you, often you'll get uh, students, Filipinos, that will, will pass the listening, you know, get a seven, the reading mm. will get a seven, um, speaking will get a seven, and then almost invariably 6.5 in writing. Now, um, if native speak, because of the, the silly rules and regulations about what's expected, um, mm -hmm. I just find that uh, hideous. Uh, it, it's often, you know, it's it's great for, for the British Council and IDP because they keep making money. It's a money-making mm -hmm. imposition uh, and it's culturally inappropriate. So um, I what I teach in my method is how to get around it with uh, to pass even given these hindrances, so having mm -hmm. seen what, what happens. So I'm not a, a um, I, I'm, I'm so with nurses recently coming here, I've been mm -hmm. pushing for IELTS to be dropped to 6.5 overall. Why do you need a seven to be able to be a good nurse? I mean, how on earth yeah. does that make you a better nurse or a better physician? It's just insane. So, um, it, uh, it, it's, it's not fair. And mm -hmm. in terms of um, the Philippines, uh, English proficiency is. Well, you can sit next to a jeepney driver and have a conversation in English often. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's, where, where can you do? You can't do that in Vietnam. You can't do that yeah. in any other Asian country. Exactly. And, and, yes. and I will, just a little anecdote. I remember getting my shoes polished because I, I had boots one time, and mm -hmm. uh, it was down in uh, Mabini in the street there. And um, a guy was uh, he was from uh, um, uh, Mountain Province. And I didn't realize that many people from Mountain Province and, and from that area often had good English. Uh, Very better good than English, Carlos. yes. Yeah, and because they would have been around Americans a lot. And uh, and and he said, what do you do? And I said, well, I, I teach Shakespeare at the university and uh, at the University of the Philippines. You know what he said to me, Rene? <laughs> he said, tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps on this petty pace to the last syllable of recorded time, and all our yesterdays have lighted fools their way to dusty death. He, he could quote Shakespeare to me. <laughs> wow. So, yeah, what urgent country is <laughs> No, seriously. So, yeah, um, yeah no. Love yeah. the and, and, and one thing about the IELTS doc is uh, it has an expiration. I never realized that it oh, like, yeah. after. I know. I mean, Isn't so that it's really money, money making, oh, really, yeah. you know, Every two, you, oh no, absolutely, it's money making nonsense. Every two years, apparently, your English collapses and you forget everything, so you've got to reset. Yeah, I mean, everything. <laughs> right. And how can you explain to me how you pass it, say in two thousand and fifteen, in two thousand seventeen, you fail? Mm -hmm. Has your English faded? No, it's it's <laughs> uh, it's it's a extremely um, um, unfair. In position ah, yeah, that's Filipino mm -hmm. students. So, if you're going to go to an IELTS class to learn, you have to need you, you need techniques to pass. You don't mm -hmm. really need your English to improve. You need techniques, techniques. to. Uh, that's to, correct. Yeah, yeah, because your English isn't going to improve uh, yeah. in, in two or three months. It won't happen. So, uh, so our uh, viewers and listeners, if you want to, you know, get around, uh, get some techniques, uh, get in touch with uh, Doctor Hisley or myself, yeah, okay. and I will. Point yeah, you, you to uh, <laughs> point you to Doctor Hisley. Doc, you said you had a liver cancer and you had a liver transplant. Uh, that was, mm -hmm. I think, it happened. Oh, uh, let me backtrack a bit. You were planning to go back to the Philippines with with your wife because you were mm -hmm. planning to put up a school. Can you mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about that, uh, Doc? Yeah, sure. So um, I thought, you know, um, I, I I love the place and uh, we. we my wife and I were planning to set up a, a junior secondary school uh, mm -hmm. in uh, Bumagetti um, and uh, to, to build it using green, clean technology, bamboo bespoke buildings and, you know, uh, recyclables and uh, uh, green energy, et cetera, et cetera. 
uh, funded by the Knights of Rizal because I'm, I am a Knight of Rizal and it's 25,000 of them in the world. So, and to uh, uh, have students who were from poor families but have been academically successful uh, as a boarding school. But um, COVID hit. We were, we'd mm. sold up. We were leaving in April 2020. COVID hit. Mm. And then I discovered that I had uh, cancer in my bladder and that got fixed. And, and then um, inoperable cancer in my liver. So COVID actually saved my life because uh, I ended up getting a, a liver transplant for free because the New Zealand health system provides mm. that. And post, and I've recovered it's 10 months ago today, actually, um, that I oh. had this transplant and uh, I'm in full perfect health again. Now, had I gone to Dumaguete, mm. I'd be penniless because that's multi-millions of pesos operation. Yeah. Yeah, very, very expensive. So very fortunate, Renee, not mm -hmm. to have gone at the time that I did because uh, you and I wouldn't be talking right now. I'd be I'd be uh, ashes in an urn next to my wife's bed. <laughs> but but, but uh, once the borders are open and uh, you're you, you still plan to uh, pursue oh, this absolutely. dream, yes, yes. yeah. In fact, what my wife and I have done is we've planted um, three hectares in giant bamboo in uh, mm. in uh, Pagadian and uh, uh, in uh, a place called Siluka, which is near Liloy, south mm. of Dipolo, uh, halfway to Zamboanga del Norte. For those that don't know. Uh, uh, Zamboanga. So um, uh, we that takes about th four years to grow. So uh, and that's uh, we will be using that to to help build the school and uh, and to build a home of our own. So that's in process and that's clean green technology. Mm -hmm. It's planted. It takes about oh, four wow. years. Um, and and also it's it's quite profitable. You can take the money from you know a hectare in, in planted in that would. Uh, after four years, should bring you between ten and fifteen million pesos, mm -hmm. um, and that's that's good money. Um, yeah. So that should be enough to to fund everything. Fund so we can build in, yeah, and you have to build a home, fund the school, but also get the Knights of Resolve behind it to to fund it as well. So that's the plan. That's the plan. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, now that I've you know survived a life threatening um, health issue. Um, and mm -hmm. still, look, still look okay. My hair hasn't grown, but <laughs> it's all right. Mind you, mind you, it hasn't been here for twenty years, so nothing, nothing personal. Really. Yeah, this is Doc. not a result of chemotherapy. All stuff, you know. Doc, that's what I call uh, uh, less hair to comb, more face to wash. That, that's the that's kind of exactly look. right. Exactly right. Isn't it? Yeah, but Doc. You, do you still drive the motorcycle now after your operation? No, I, I think no. I saw your picture. Ah, it was yeah, an old yeah. picture. Yeah, that's a that's a the picture in Calamba, right outside mm. the big, massive statue of Rizal. I, I'm something of a of an authority on Rizal now too. You can ask me just about any question. I think I could tell you about his life, and um, but no, my wife after I broke eight ribs. Um, in Italak, and after all this, my wife read the Riot Act, and you don't disagree <laughs> with a with a Filipino <laughs> wife from Lilo unless you want to suffer <laughs> severe consequences. So now, no, it's walking and uh, and buses, Renee. Much as I would love to, mm -hmm. yeah, um, I, I have to uh, um, show some respect to my wife's uh, fears for my <laughs> long term. Well, well, about now going to Rizal. Uh, well, for our viewers, uh, Doctor Jose Rizal is the national hero of the Philippines, and uh, there is a there is a movement called uh, the Knights of Rizal. It's it's a uh, it's a movement of uh, social civic uh, leaders. So, why did you join this? I I think I was at that was it in two thousand nineteen when when you got your. They, they, your knighthood or something. I think I was there. I was, I was. Yeah, or, yeah I, I think you were, Renee. So, um, actually, I, I'm a good friends with uh, Ambassador Gary Domingo, Jesus mm -hmm. Domingo. Uh, people know him as Amber, and he is a uh, high up in the Knights of Rizal. And he asked me on a number of occasions, "Would I like to?" I, I had a history of um, of uh, Filipino human rights here, trying to protect Filipinos from. Uh, predatory uh, tertiary education uh -huh. and uh, closed down one of the dodgy, one of the bad ones. And uh, 
that was a fair bit of work. So uh, Ambassador Domingo uh, uh, invited me actually to to apply um, to be a knight, and I thought and, uh, I was a little reluctant because I thought, what's um, a non-Filipino doing in, in in this kind of structure? There's you've had enough colonial experience, and I didn't want to I didn't want to add to it. Uh, but but I don't come across as that kind of figure, and in the knights and Rizal. Uh, was uh, had many um, uh, European friends himself, uh, so it's non-racial. Um, it's mm -hmm. it's it's um, it's not uh, sectarian in any way. Uh, it's secular. Uh, um, the the notions are uh, for in, in inclusiveness, um, uh, um, scientific method. Um, mm -hmm. It's free of uh, religious uh, um, um, bias. So it all made a lot of sense that I should, you know, be. So I was honoured to be knighted and uh, become a knight of Rizal. Um, and a couple of interesting things, like the Knights of Rizal were set up and, uh, 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 through uh, um, uh, Philippine uh, char 646 Charter the same year I was born, 1951. How old is that? And uh, in Rizal's last sister, uh, a Trinidad, known as Trining, she died in 1951, the year I was born. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, it was a hundred years after Paciano, his brother, um, had been uh, had been born. Uh, that's General Paciano. So mm -hmm. um, lots of things seem to, you know, uh, be serendipitous mm -hmm. in in that sense. And then and and I um, and I've continued to do work as the Knights do, uh, trying to promote uh, um, the Philippine rights. The most recent one has been an attempt by me to. Uh, have nurses not have to do to attain mm -hmm. a seven in IELTS here uh, by mm -hmm. arguing that it's racially inappropriate and culturally uh, inappropriate. So yeah, that's how I got involved in the nights, Renee. Mm -hmm. And and uh, Jose Rizal was also uh, he was a scholar, he was a traveler, he studied in in Europe. I think he yeah. went to many places except New Zealand and Australia. He was in, in Asia, Europe, uh, the US. Yeah. So. Yeah. I think he embodies uh, what most of us Filipinos are doing right now as OFWs. Well, know, yes. Well, Filipino. the only thing uh, the only thing he couldn't really do was he wasn't a singer, but he was uh, oh. he, he was a great linguist. He, his his English was excellent. You can see his letters uh, in the result centered down in in Dapitan. His English is excellent. Mm. His French was good. Uh, his mm. German was excellent. Um, so he was he was functionally. Uh, uh, um, um, he was functional in 22 languages and knew others. Yeah. Um, so he was a great linguist. And he, But actually one of his things I like most about Rizzo was his sculpture, his ability to, mm -hmm. to, to sculpt. Uh, mm -hmm. You'll see the, you'll see the uh, victory of, uh, of science over death, that beautiful statue of a, of a female that you see outside um, uh, uh, UP uh, uh, Medical School uh, in mm -hmm. town. Um, and that's his carving. Um, he, he's a wonderful sculptor. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so he was a multifaceted human being. And mm -hmm. when you think that what he achieved, um, when, uh, he was 35 years, six months, and 11 days old when he was assassinated. Mm -hmm. So what a what he what he packed what into of, life. Yeah. So that's a that's a Filipino and. Um, and his statues are everywhere in the world because of the mm -hmm. Philippine diaspora. Many Philippine communities, you name you name the country, is probably mm -hmm. Rosalian statue. And Auckland has got its own Rosal Reserve. That's um, correct. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So um, it, it's uh, it's a very interesting man. Mm -hmm. I've, I've been to their ancestral home uh, in Kalamba. And uh, because I'm from Sambuanga, I also visited uh, Dapitan, where he was exiled. Yes. Um, because uh, I was a Boy Scout. So in the Boy Scout, the highest rank is the Rizal Scout. So okay. before you become a Rizal Scout, in, in well, in Sambuanga, in our area, we have to do pilgrimage to Dapitan. But unfortunately, I wasn't able to reach the Rizal Scout. I was just uh, Maratas, the second. But mm -hmm. I've seen what he has done in that place, in Dapitan. You, you know, he, he created well, like a... So 
Yeah, that's so Ass that's the man. Assistant that's the man. for water, you know. Yep, yep. So he's not just a scholar, he was a practical man. So that's the praxis. So he set up a wonderful water engineering scheme there. Mm -hmm. He grew Apaka, Apaka to to finance stuff. He want he um he he was a very practical uh, person and so that school uh reflected there was the one time where he was forced to stay put because he'd been exiled so four years in one place if mm. you look at his travel he he circumnavigated he traveled more than ninety thousand kilometers he was six months at sea on three trips around the world he was on trains constantly in europe so dapitan was the one place where fortunate i mean unfortunately but fortunately mm -hmm. you were able to see the practical side of the bloke yes. so that's what's so wonderful about that I mean, it's not just a you mentioned ivory tower before no it wasn't ivory tower. he was an ophthalmologist uh, you know mm -hmm. he was a he was a zoologist uh, um, uh, uh, and he wrote some wonderful poetry there as well uh, but uh multifaceted bloke um mm -hmm. you know uh, he, he would stand in comparison with any of the great people mm -hmm. who died in their yeah. mid-30s yeah. A couple of years uh, ago, Doc, uh, you, because I'm fond of doing a what-if uh, story, so I did an article about uh, Dr. Jose Rizal celebrating his first birthday, oh. now the present. So, oh. uh, yeah, I, I will share you with you the what uh, what I've written, Doc. So, oh, because it's yeah. it's like the first, so it's the first birthday. So you know, Filipinos, we make a fuss of out of it gifts yep. and everything uh so it's either jollibee or mcdonald's so i i i researched a, a jollibee near his house you know, you know things like that nice. <laughs> so what if he was born today yeah. because a lot of people are well some are critical of him but he has done wonderful things to the filipino uh nation uh it, as, as you were saying all over the world there is a rizal a statue there's a you know uh to to honor him there's even a group in the philippines they call themselves uh rizalistas, rizalistas you know the, the ones yeah, that make money yeah, they, they stay in mount banahaw i think uh, mm -hmm. and, and they they well it's a different uh thing so your passion for history uh dr hisley is still alive because with rizal oh. now uh, you, you know, recently I watched the Van Gogh uh, exhibit here in Auckland, oh, too, yeah. and and I got rekindled to the idea of what if uh, Rizal and Van Gogh, because I researched, they were like nearly uh, in the same in Paris, mm -hmm. nearly the same time. They were. So, they were. <laughs> that's another and article he, that I'm trying. <laughs> right. Well, he, he was also in 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 uh, England uh, researching uh, in the in the in the British Museum. Uh, mm -hmm. At the same time that Marx was there, uh, mm -hmm. so he, he missed uh, con contact with Marx. But um, uh, he, his linguistic skills meant that he was able to get some pretty beautiful women helping him in his languages. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, if you want to flirt in court, um, it's really <laughs> good to speak German, to hook up with a German girl, or uh, yeah. to speak French to hook up with with uh, Nelly Bustot, who's a really beautiful woman. Uh, part Filipino down in Biarritz, and he nearly yeah. uh, he nearly had a duel over over her because Antonio Luna once got drunk as a skunk mm. and partially abused or, or, or um, spoke ill of her, and that nearly ended up with a duel. So what if he had had a duel with Antonio Luna uh, mm. in Biarritz? Uh, he might well have been killed, or Antonio Luna may have died earlier and not ended up as. You know, uh, chop suey in uh, in Cabanatuan later on in this life. Yeah, yeah. So, um, <laughs> yeah. what if? Yeah, yeah. And also, uh, Doctor Hisley uh, Rizal in Europe. I think when sometimes because their stipend doesn't reach in time, so if they're hungry, so he will, uh, you know, he will pose for for the paintings of the yeah. one of the lunas. You know, so that yeah, 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 one luna. <laughs> Yeah, so this is some really, there's a wonderful painting of him, but uh, that one Luna did, and remember, one Luna kind of went uh, um, crazy himself and and murdered his wife by shooting her through yes. through more. Mm -hmm. um, but um, uh, yeah, he he was very poor and uh, often and uh, relied on, often on his sisters, to, uh, mm -hmm. who sent him uh, jewelry, money, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But most of all, his brother actually financed him through his those days yes it was the brother yes. and also got him out of the country and just in time 
um, mm-hmm. back in, in 1882. So, um, yeah, no, it's, uh, uh, it's, 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 it's a pity people don't look more deeply at uh, the real man. And, and uh, uh, he, he really, people say revolutionary or, or uh, whatever. He was really more, more a Gandhian figure. A, um, a, a non-violent change, more a, mm-hmm. uh, a, um, a Martin Luther King mm-hmm. uh, would be a better exemp- example of what he wanted. He wanted, he wanted Philippine uh, independence, uh, but he, he didn't uh, necessarily want a revolution when people didn't have the arms or the education for it. That was his view. I see him more as a Gandhian figure, uh, and mm-hmm. uh, my friend, my friend uh, Floro, in the uh, wonderful historian in uh, australia uh um pointed that out and that's and i thinking about it yeah a gandhian figure would be a better description rather than because you can't compare him to bonifacio uh and you know a figure oh, yeah, who's because, a, yeah, a true, true, well true revolutionary and it's not a matter of this or that it's more different people with different mm-hmm. approaches to bonifacio or or or, or Rizal. And uh, so, um, yeah, more a Gandhian or Martin Luther King figure would be my interpretation mm. of of, uh, of him. Yeah. Are, are you doing any writing, though, uh, now? I mean, do, do you do any writing? Yeah, yeah actually, I'm, I'm, I'm prepared. I'm writing. A, um, at, at the moment, I'm doing a 35-minute description of Rizal's life. Uh, oh, and I've called, okay. I've called it the, the, the Great Coat, Seven Threads of a Great Coat, to try and enthuse mm-hmm. When students are forced to study uh, uh, things like the noli or, or the fili, they get resentful. Mm. It's interesting because if, if you're young and you're forced to study something, nurses, for example, have to study Rizal in their nursing and, and, and they get resentful about it. So they memorize some stuff and then instantly mm. forget it. So what I'm trying to do is enthuse people about the reinterpret Rizal. Uh, and I start off with this with his execution because you understand he was – he was shot by Filipinos, not by Spaniards. Yes. The, Mag- mm-hmm. the Magallanes Company, seven men, the 70th Regiment, they shot him using uh, a, a, a particular rifle. Um, and and so technically he was assassinated by Filipinos, but right mm-hmm. behind those six or seven men um, does, yes. were, were the Spanish with Moser rifles, and they would have shot. Um, the Filipinos had they not shot mm-hmm. uh, Rizal. So that's the mm-hmm. definition of colonial uh, imperial uh, brutality, in my it view. Is. So mm-hmm. I start my story with his death and then track it back and then trace back through his sisters, uh, mm-hmm. through his particular lovers. And I think his his great love was uh, Osei-san. And he, he was only with her for one month. That's the Japanese lady in 1882. Mm-hmm. Uh, sorry, 1886. He, uh, 82, uh, he, he met her, no, it was 86, mm-hmm. in, in Yokohama, and she, he was, she was his brief, but I think most, uh, you know, most powerful mother. Well, I don't know about meaningful, it have to be Josephine Bracken, because they had a child together. Ah, done, but, ah, but, yes. um, but, 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 you know, w- one month you can have, hey, he's a, he's a 30 year old, very handsome. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, multilingual guy. You know, he's a normal human being. Of course, he's going to have a lot of romance, uh, mm-hmm. and not the ones that you normally think about as as the seven loves. Um, yeah, the, he's a he's a young, handsome bloke in Europe in the eighteen mm-hmm. eighties. He would have had a lot of girlfriends, and um, mm-hmm. so in my description of him, I try to paint him as a real life, you know, yeah. flesh and yeah. blood human being, and not mm-hmm. not this cardboard cutout figure yeah, yeah. that's and what i'm talking not, about. oh good that's oh, good and also, and also not yeah sorry <laughs> go ahead renee no uh, go, go, go ahead uh, no. no i was gonna and, and the other thing i've done is trace uh, another 35 minute um, thing which i'll share with you with you and your viewers at some stage if they want is the philippines from um um six uh, uh 60 million years to 1896 the cry you know um um, I, I'm looking at because the Philippines now is it's a cultural center like like a major human uh, intersection and nexus for the whole st- st- growth story of humanity not some adjunct thing but a very important center of a spoke of wheels because mm-hmm. there's all kinds of new discoveries 
of uh, different uh, past forms of human beings in the Philippines uh, um, show that the Philippines is critically important in, in human evolution. So I, I'm, I'm working on that at the moment to try and enthuse mm -hmm. students about, because I, I remember, Renee, it used to really alarm me. I was, I'm doing IELTS, yeah? I'm in Cagayan uh, mm -hmm. de Oro, let's say, um, and uh, uh, someone has said to me, like, before the Spanish came, we were like monkeys living in trees. <laughs> I, I, I swear to God, that's what I heard to my ears. And I thought, what are these kids learning in school? Mm -hmm. and, and then I would see pictures like uh, 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 ebony and ivory. No, ebony to ivory. So the picture of a, uh, of a beautiful morena girl. And then next mm -hmm. to that picture, there'd be a mestizo much fairer. And, and mm -hmm. that's what you're supposed to look like. Mm -hmm. not, the more, not the beautiful morena, the gorgeous mestizo. Mestiza, and and that's a very deep, um, uh, radically unhealthy view of Filipino beauty, and mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I'm, I'm looking at another thing too, which is uh, discipline. I looking at the what, what it is to to accept your the beauty that is that shouldn't be defined by Spanish notions of beauty. See, I have this big nose, Renee. Can you see? <laughs> My tongue wants. That's supposed to be something fantastic in the Philippines. <laughs> Even if you're ugly, if you have this long nose, <laughs> you know, blue eyes. So <laughs> these things have to change. This is a deeply yeah. uh, unhelpful view of beauty. Mm -hmm. uh, so and, I, they're, and, yeah. and they're trying to propagate it through the, the whitening soap, the cream and everything in the Philippines, which is like my... <laughs> No, Renee. I used to go into into uh, um, in, into the pharmacies there, um, uh -huh. and for a joke, and say, "Excuse me, do you have any skin uh, tanner? You know, uh, <laughs> tanning solution?" And the girl behind the counter would look at me like I'm crazy. What? What do you? But sure, you're beautiful. You're white. No, 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 no. Where I come from, brown is beautiful. White is ugly. It means you're sick. Do you have any? No browning solution, and they'd run around trying. No, they couldn't make any sense of it. We have the whitening. I'm white already. I don't want to be white. <laughs> so I used to have a bit of fun with that whole, well, it, you know, left wing kind of radical views of what it is. Yeah. <laughs> Try and change so, people thinking, you know. <laughs> Doctor Easley, it's really interesting every time I get to talk to you, and uh, uh, hopefully I'll, I'll get to see you uh, in the next couple of weeks. Let's have a cup of coffee and uh, you know, uh, talk some more. Uh, it's been a, a very uh, pri privileged time for us to, to learn about you know your, your passion for research, for uh, mm. putting your doctorate into real life, you know, like mm. what you're doing now, mm. uh, because. I, I was part of that generation that we had to memorize uh, Rizal. Uh, it was a three-unit course, I think. Uh -huh. uh, the, awesome. So yeah, so uh, I and uh, it's just like no, it, it's something that I I, I know I wouldn't want to do. <laughs> no, no, I, you want it to be. It's got to be um, a real human being, Renee, to to be able to yeah. people to relate to. Yeah, and mm -hmm. can I just say, Renee, before we go. How, how important what you're doing in New Zealand is. My res greatest respect to you, Renee. You, you have continued on with this advocacy. You're a, you're a, a wonderful example of uh, a Filipino living abroad and uh, with pride in his uh, culture and pride in his inheritance. And I salute you for that, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hisley. And uh, it's really my passion to... to I, I think they say if the... If you're away from your homeland, the more you're, I, I'm like that, the more I, I, I yearn for. And and sometimes I'm thinking, oh, why did I miss that? Why didn't I go to that place? Why didn't I? Oh. So uh, I, I try to connect uh, everything. Uh, I, uh, so thank you very much, <laughs> Dr. Easley. Yeah. Doc, uh, all the best in what, what you're doing, and um, I'll, I'll definitely keep in touch. I, I got the email already, so I will look at the at the document that you sent, your, your, your thesis. Yeah. yeah, and uh, hopefully uh, the tidbits of uh, information that uh, Dr. Murray Hisley has uh, shared with us will be 
able to inspire you listeners and viewers in your research, in whatever it is you're doing for your doctorate or your master's. Okay. Thank good you very much, for Dom. And uh, good night and all the best. Okay. Thank you, you very much. Nice. Thank you very much for watching and listening to us. God bless.